So I'm going to make a start, folks. Uh, welcome to the third session today of what will be uh, a combination of peer review. But uh, I would say that I think the next week is a, is a very critical part of uh, our kind of uh, journey in lung ultrasound in that what we will be talking a lot about is the basics of lung ultrasound uh, physiology, uh, a little bit about uh, ultrasound physics, uh, and in particular, then moving on from these topics to try and formalize uh, your ability to use terminology in lung ultrasound, which is what I call nomenclature. And we'll be using uh, very much standardized nomenclature that's endorsed by uh, the the European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care POCUS Working Group. Uh, it's, it's standardized terminology that's used throughout uh, in the States uh, as well as in uh, Europe. And you know, I'm hoping hopefully from our perspective, we'll be able to take this forwards. Uh, as a first, I am going to introduce you to Mayank, who will be sharing the first of the cases. So Mayank, just a short introduction for yourself, please, and then please crack on. Sure. So good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be presenting two cases for the peer review. Uh, my name is Dr. Mayank Priyadashi. I'm working as a consultant in the Department of Neonatology at Ames Rishikesh, India. So... Uh, the machine which I have been using is a Sonocyte Edge 2 machine, which looks something like this with a linear probe, uh, which is L25X, uh, 25X transducer, ranges from 6 to 13 uh, megahertz. I use the lung exam mode, which is available uh, on the exam in the lower most uh, bottom most uh, uh, panel. And uh, I usually set the uh, resolution to maximum so that I get the maximum frequency of 13 megahertz. And I usually adjust the depth to 4.3 centimeters. So uh, this brings to my first case. So this was a term baby who was admitted on day six of life for excessive weight loss. The birth weight was three kg and gestation was 38 weeks. The baby did not have any respiratory issue and was maintaining saturation well on room air. So I chose this case to just get an idea what a normal lung looks like. So I performed this exam with L25 linear probe. And uh, one of the limitation was that I obtained the images in the posterior area just after making the baby prone and did not wait for one hour, uh, which would uh, have been ideal, I think. So uh, I have imaged uh, all the 12 regions, but for the sake of presentation, I'll be presenting uh, six regions three from the left lung and three from the right lung. And uh, uh, let's begin with the first reason. This, uh, the images have been labeled as they were. So in L1 region, uh, if we move systematically, I can appreciate uh, uh, an almost normal looking pleural line, which is sliding well. I can see some A lines all as well as, as uh, some B lines. So uh, there are more than three B lines uh, in a single space. So I would classify this as an AB profile. And I do not find any areas of consolidation or uh, pleural uh, or uh, um, effusion. So when I move to L3 reason, uh, again, I find uh, a normal looking pleura, which is sliding again well. The areas which I, I can appreciate most of the uh, areas are dominated by A lines and there are some comet tail artifacts that I can appreciate. However, I would classify this as uh, A profile and I do not find any consultation again and any effusion. So coming to the L5 reason, so the image is not so well. The baby was, uh, when the baby was made prone, the baby was moving a lot. And uh, what I could appreciate in the areas which uh, can be seen as A lines again, and I do not, I feel that this is an, again, an A profile, uh, and there's no consolidation or effusion as such. So now, if we move to the uh, right. Uh, Maya, can I, yeah. yeah, can we just go back to those images? If that's, uh, so just your last yeah. slide. Yeah, so we're just looking at, uh, you know, the L1, uh, uh, the L3, which is uh, obviously the lateral, and then the L5 would be a posterior region. And I think the, I mean, very nice, good images, 
good depth. So just a few things for me to point out. So when you look at the ribs, you can see two ribs. Now an ideal standardized image should have two intercostal spaces. So you, you should be able to see three ribs at the top. Now the way to get that uh, is to basically either zoom out and basically make the image slightly smaller so that you can actually see three rib spaces per field. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing that I would, I would recommend is that your images are a little bit grainy. Now, every ultrasound machine basically has what is called a soft or sharp mode. Now, again, uh, your focus basically at this stage, it's kind of at the level of the plural margin, which is why the plural looks beautiful. Uh, because you're using a very high frequency probe, uh, 13, this was a term baby, was it? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes what so what I'd say is that your superficial structures have come out quite nicely because your frequencies are higher. But actually, don't mm -hmm. hesitate to play with the frequency to reduce it. And, you know, for term babies, especially for the depth marking, what mm -hmm. might be important is that you use a lower frequency because with a higher frequency, what is happening is you can see the superficial areas really nicely. You've got mm -hmm. these acoustic shadows behind the ribs, but then the deeper mm -hmm. structures, I mean, these are A-lines. Uh, can you see my marker? You probably can't. No, no. Okay. So uh, these. Yeah, these ones. Exactly. They're A-lines. And my gut feeling is that if you'd used a slightly lower frequency, what you would have mm -hmm. seen is you would have seen more of an A profile with uh, less accentuation of the B-lines that you see there. So mm -hmm. from our perspective, my only uh, kind of two comments would be zoom out. You need three ribs here. Okay. Secondly, while you're focused on the plural line, you might want to play with your frequency just to make sure that you can see slightly deeper structures as well. And don't hesitate. You might want to save more than one image at this particular point. Now, classically, mm -hmm. because your baby has been probably, uh, so was the baby supine and then you turned him prone or prone and then you turned him supine? The baby was supine and then turned him prone. Okay. So, I mean... Uh, I suspect what you're seeing here, I mean, you do see a very dense B profile here with some A lines. Mm -hmm. And I think the interpretation mm -hmm. that we have is probably because the frequency is slightly on the higher side. But yes, beautiful oh. lung sliding. Can you show uh, the audience some comet tails there? Oh, okay. Uh, in the uh, the second one? Yes, please. Uh, I think there were some, some comet tails in the L3 regions and yeah. also in... So I think uh, in between there are some uh, comet tails. Uh, okay. Now some frames. My only comment about the L3 and the L5 images is because the plane. So if you look at L1, it's beautiful. It's at right angles. So you're perpendicular mm -hmm. to the actual plane, which is why you're getting an absolutely beautiful yeah. image. But with both L3 and L5, there's a loss of contact, and you're not entirely perpendicular. That kind of means uh, you're not actually getting uh, a very uh, good lateral field. Again, uh, I'd say you probably just need to reduce the frequency. And a lot of what you're seeing on this side uh, is what mm -hmm. I would call is artifact. So if you go to L5 in particular, just on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, left of the screen, you see a very dense area that sometimes looks like consolidation. Just if you go to the left, mm -hmm. that's it. A little bit, yeah, mm -hmm. more leftwards, yeah. Now, I would say that, again, what that needs is it needs a little bit of better delineation and uh, okay. the probe being completely perpendicular in that position. Now, if your baby is mm -hmm. moving, my, mm -hmm. my, the question is, are you applying too much pressure? And I suspect to try and better your image, you're applying a lot of pressure, which is why the okay. baby is recessing more. So again, just when you put the probe on, the weight of the probe mm -hmm. should be completely off the baby. It's mere contact that you want. The okay. more uh, you, you struggle with image resolution, the harder you press, the more difficult it will be to get images. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd say your L1 image is beautiful. L3, L4, good. But yeah, mm -hmm. we can uh, we can make it a little bit better by those changes. So we'll go to your next okay. slide. Sorry, uh, okay. can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So how do you know, how, how you decide the right frequency? Because, you know, sometimes the... Uh, the linear pop is actually a range, right? Yep. So it is. And what I'd say is that when you're using the preset with our linear probe, it defaults to a, a 11 or 12. Yes. And there's a small marker there. So 
when you want to look at superficial structures uh, in extremely preterm babies, and I'll talk about that today, really you're starting with a frequency of anywhere 11, 12. But for the smaller babies, actually, you might want to use a frequency of between 8 and 10, 9 and 10 even. And really, if you want to look at deeper structures, then you, you probably just want to reduce the frequency because that will make these images a little bit less grainy. But uh, Leila, yeah. we can practice that on the unit. I can show you how to do it. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. So, Shall I move to the next? Yeah. so Kirti has got a question. Yeah. Um, so when I tried on the machine, there were all these presets for musculoskeletal, thyroid, but there was no focus for me to change it from fluid line to yeah. deeper into the tissue. Does yeah. that make a difference? Yes. Uh, no, because your presets basically are set in such a way that your focus is fixed. And that's the disadvantage of using a preset transducer mode. Uh, whereas if you go into MSK without a, a kind of a preset mode, you, you can change depth, you can change frequency, uh, but you might not be able to change the focus. So again, what I'd say is that you might not want to use a preset mode in that situation. But generally, I'd say most of the preset modes at high frequency will give you very, very good resolution superficially. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, for those of you who don't have a preset lung mode, MSK superficial is beautiful for lung in uh, preterm babies and extremely preterm babies. You can use it. What it does is it resets to a default depth, usually of about two, 2.5 centimeters. So you might have to increase that to four. And then if you want to get three ribs, uh, because you've obviously increased depth, you might have to zoom in, zoom out a little bit. So uh, we'll obviously, uh, what, what I will be doing is sharing how I do that on the GE uh, next week. But I would be really grateful if, uh, like Mike, next time you use your machine, because I think you've got an absolutely beautiful machine there, is just uh, go through how you might be able to zoom in, zoom out, and what you did differently to try and get three ribs to intercostal spaces within your field next time. Okay. 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 We can move on. So uh, Very this nice. is the beautiful. Yeah. So this is the right lung, the R2 area. So uh, I can see the interface between the lung and the liver. And I can see beautiful uh, pleural line, which is sliding well, and uh, the it is dominated by A line. So this is completely, uh, so this is absolutely A profile, no B lines, and uh, no consolidation or effusion. So if I move to R4, so uh, uh, I can see that the pleural line is uh, almost normal. Um, which is sliding well as well, and it is mostly dominated by the uh, A lines. However, I can appreciate some of the uh, B lines. Uh, I was a little bit confused on this because I felt that uh, sometimes I felt that this was B lines, and sometimes I felt this was cometal artifacts. So um, I had actually in my interpretation in reporting, so I had interpreted as uh, AB profile, and uh, as uh, uh, there are, I feel that the B lines are more than three in a rib space. So this is my interpretation for the R4 area. And if I move to the R6 area, so I can appreciate again a normal looking pleura, uh, which is uh, sliding well. Again, um, A lines mostly. Uh, there are uh, B lines as well, uh, some B lines, which is more than actually three in a single rib space. So again, I would label this as AB profile. Um, I'm not so sure if I'm right, but uh, this is my interpretation. So over to you. Sure. So we, I'm going to kind of cover profiles next time. Uh, but okay, okay. I think what I'd say is that if you look at R2 and R4, these are beautiful A profiles. They're, you've basically got plural sliding, uh, very uh, sharp, uh, normal, regular plura uh, with parallel reverberation A-lines. You can see the liver in between. Uh, now, when you come to R4, uh, again, uh, what, is, what you're demonstrating over here is a very beautiful transition. You're doing the supine, the baby supine, right? Or prone? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Supine. R4 is supine. Okay. So what you're seeing is basically with gravity, fluid tends to redistribute. And while you can't see any comet tails or uh, any B lines in R2, you can see comet tails. I'm not really sure that you can see B lines in R4. Could you just click R4 again? 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So, R4. Yeah. Yeah. So what you see is comet tails. These small, if you just point to them for the, the, the colleagues, they yes. don't go all the way down. So again, I mean, okay. all these are markers of a little bit of interstitial fluid. They're not true B lines. And for me, again, this is an A profile. Uh, good sliding, okay. uh, you know, a, a good marker. But when you go to R6, which is the posterior part of the baby, you clearly mm-hmm. see that because of dependent nature of a baby, you've got what mm-hmm. is, uh, you've got B lines, which are the vertical lines that extend all the way down. Uh, the mm-hmm. plural looks a little bit irregular. Now, I'm going to be honest to say, I think some of what you're seeing with the plura being irregular again is because you're not completely at 90 degrees. Now, to okay. be at 90 degrees, uh, what, what you need to do is, like if the baby, say, is uh, prone and you're examining the back at that particular point of time, then what sometimes happens is that the probe basically becomes oblique or the upper half of the probe loses contact, as you can see at the top end of the margin. And that's where I mm-hmm. would say that uh, a good way of trying to prevent that from happening is putting a small towel under the baby's chest, just so that the, okay. the, rather than having a sloping back, because the back tends to slope. Mm-hmm. I mean, I tend to hunch a lot. So really, you might mm-hmm. want to just put a towel under the baby's chest uh, to try and keep the back as straight as possible and maintain your contact. What you'll find is that when you get to R6, which is the right lower posterior or L6, mm-hmm. it's easier. But actually, when you do R5, because of the scapula, mm-hmm. because of the back of the bones, you often have a lot of uh, what I'd call reflection artifact. Uh, and mm-hmm. that confounds things, but you don't get clear margins. But usually R6, L6, you should be able to get nice, nice and vertical. But again, very nice mm-hmm. images. Uh, so a, a baby, did the baby have any respiratory distress? Nothing. Bond or no, bond. no. Okay. No. And again, this is where I would say clinical correlation is key. So, I mean, uh, looking at R6, somebody might want to say, well, those lungs look wet, but actually what I'd say is this is gravity for you. And actually in a baby who has no respiratory distress and is clinically well, who's three days old. So just remember, there is a beautiful video on the first breath to transition. So if you look at the first breath to transition, you know, majority of babies will establish lung aeration within the first few hours, but the persistence of between one and three B lines per intercostal space is well known for a very, very long period of time. In babies who have delayed clearance of lung fluid, they may not be symptomatic. You may not have any respiratory distress, but gravity based uh, kind of uh, alveolar interstitial kind of fluid is definitely visible. And I would say it's very important that you look at your baby clinically before deciding. That's lovely. Would you like to go to the next case, Mayank? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I had made this uh, performer and had filled. Uh, so most of the things I have, uh, we have already discussed. So I'll move to the second case. Sure. So my second case uh, was again a term baby who was admitted uh, at the time of birth for perinatal asphyxia. The gestation was 38 weeks with a birth weight of 2.9 kg and the baby was born through emergency LSCS in view of fetal distress and meconium stain lica. So the the initial diagnosis we kept was meconium aspiration syndrome with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy stage 2 and the baby was undergoing uh, uh, therapeutic hypothermia. The baby uh, was intubated on uh, assist control mode of ventilation with volume guarantee. The tidal volume was set at 4 ml per kg and the working PIP was quite high at 22 and the uh, PEEP was 6 centimeters and the FiO2 was 25 percent. So these, uh, so I performed the lung ultrasound at eight hours of life with uh, the linear pro and uh, one of the uh, limitations was that uh, the posterior, I could not uh, image the posterior areas uh, ideally and were done at posterior axillary line. So uh, so this was uh, the x-ray which was available available a little later i had performed the lung ultrasound uh, when this was not available so in this x-ray i can appreciate that the uh, this is an ap view uh, which is uh, non rotated uh, good exposure there are some artifacts um, which is due to the hypothermic mattress uh, the soft tissue and the rib cage bony cage appears to be normal uh, this uh, uh, an enlarged harsh shadow which right atrial dominance probably due, due to some uh, PPHN component I can appreciate a thymus coming to the lung fields these appear to be uh, slightly hyperinflated with around nine rib spaces 
and uh, uh, there are some fine uh, infiltrates which I, I can appreciate more than the right than the left and uh, uh, there's no air leak as such so i move on to the lung ultrasound images so i had uh, imaged 12 reasons however the uh, l5 and l6 were practically similar to l3 and 4 so i have omitted those images and i have presented the four uh, reasons on the left and the four reasons on the right uh, so Mayank, what age is the baby what age is the baby eight please? hours of life eight hours eight. Of life. thank you so the baby was supine okay so this is uh, the l1 reason and uh, i uh, can appreciate this uh, the pleura is slightly irregular and this uh, b lines which i can appreciate in the two rib spaces uh, i do not find any uh, a lines i can appreciate a little bit um, on in one of the rib spaces but not in the second so i would classify this as b profile uh, but no consolidation as such and uh, effusion as such. So, uh, but the, the pleura appears to be ir irregular, but sliding well. Uh, coming to the L2 reason. So, this is, uh, the pleura appears to be normal, sliding well. And this is predominantly A lines. And I would classify this as A profile uh, and uh, no consolidation or effusion. So, coming to the... L3 reason. So uh, again, the pleura appears to be normal to me and sliding well. Uh, in uh, some rib spaces, I can appreciate A lines and I would classify this as A profile. However, one of the rib spaces has confluent B lines. So I did not know how to uh, label this as. So I have labeled this as A as well as B profile. So depending on the difference uh, in the rib spaces. However, I do not know if this should be labeled as AB profile or B profile. So uh, if I come to the last uh, reason of the left lung, so this is L4, and I can appreciate a normal looking pleural line, uh, and which is uh, sliding well and dominated by A lines. Again, I would classify this as A profile, and I do not find any consolidation as such or effusion. So, if I uh, shall I move to the right lung, am I audible? Uh, yeah, you're audible, Mayank. Uh, well done. I mean, you've got some absolutely lovely images, and uh, mm -hmm. I think you know the way you're presenting them is also very good. Uh, very similar kind of feedback. When I look at L1 mm -hmm. and L2 at this particular point, is we want to have three ribs to intercostal spaces. Now, when you look at L1. Uh, if you could just point to the A lines, they're they're very it feebly is. visible. Yeah, here. So what you might have to do in this is you might have to turn the gain setting up a little bit, because mm -hmm. what is happening again is because you're using a very uh, high frequency probe, the superficial areas mm -hmm. of the lung are visible quite easily, but the deeper areas of the lung are not visible as easily. So again, mm -hmm. play with the frequency. And the other thing I would say is you probably need to turn the the gain up. What you've classically mm -hmm. got in L1 is what is classically called a double lung point because you would have had a lines where your arrow is so just take your arrow to mm -hmm. the a lines uh, the, a lines in l1 l1 this. l1 yeah. so those are mm -hmm. that's that basically if you had good gain settings would would have been a lines with a normal lung profile and you've oh, got yeah. this b profile alternating which is b lines extending all the way down these are coalescent b lines uh, they, mm -hmm. they they basically have a sharp demarcation between the upper and lower lung borders, uh, lung mm -hmm. zones, which basically we call the double lung point. And it's a reflection of transitioning tissue. The pleura looks okay. quite regular uh, in the L1 image. And again, the question is, I mean, I think you've got that vertical, but it's something that I would keep a close eye on. What's the gestation of the baby? 38 weeks. And CRP is normal? Uh, CRP was a, uh, yeah, th that was normal, less than 10. Okay. So I'm going to come to L2. Now in okay. L2, when you look at the image, it's divided into two halves, right where your arrow is and left. Now, when you come to the left side of the image, yeah, bottom, right at the bottom. So can you mm -hmm. see that white area there? Yes, yes. With uh, a very sharp 
demarcated margin like a triangle so if you just point towards the triangle at the top at the top uh, no come further down in this one no 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 come further down so you are in the right space so this area of whiteness that you see on the left lower margin this actually mm -hmm. from my perspective is probably a consolidation uh more probably uh, atelectasis with consolidation i think that this is harsh shadow and uh, i feel that do you think this, it's harsh shadow harsh shadow yeah yes yes i feel that this was harsh shadow and was trying to get the lung areas but uh, it was difficult to get uh, the harsh shadow out of the uh, lung area okay it's something that i would follow up because just for the harsh shadow it's very sharp and again what you can see is it's got this triangular margin to it but yeah i would mm -hmm. completely agree that on the right side you've got a very nice clear pleural line with a line profiles throughout so that looks like normal lung to me uh okay. if you're struggling say for example to get the heart shadow out of the way what you might have to do is move to the medial part of the parasternal line and angulate the probe so and that usually helps so what i normally do is if i'm doing l1 uh and i'm getting heart shadow in the way i will go just to the upper parasternal line and then laterally i would i would try to angulate myself to try and get the heart shadow out of the way but if it does come i wouldn't be too worried l2 looks okay. normal to me then l3 what do you think about l3 l3 the upper rib space uh, uh, has dominant uh, confluent b lines yeah uh, however the lower rib spaces again i think that there's a lines predominantly and yeah. this is a profile so again yeah. double lung point that yeah. you, you were mentioning about yeah and but the upper lung field is a consolidation you've got subpleural consolidation can you see that bright area there just below the pleural line so no is come, this no 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 further down yeah further down further so if down. you if you just go to your left side yeah that area there that is that is subpleural consolidation and okay. again you've got an element of uh, atelectasis uh you you can't quite see any kind of bronchograms so actually there's no air in this so my gut feeling is it's it is probably atelectasis in that region because the pleura has completely disappeared it has completely you mm. cannot see a pleural line at all whereas below that mm. you can see a pleural line and again just mm. if you come to the middle where you see the pleural line there's a small subpleural consolidation there very small there perfect similarly if you come to the lower zone just below that again you can see a subpleural consolidation there yes so that basically from my perspective does reflect the lower end of the lung with a little bit of atelectasis and what looks like you know a dominant b profile as opposed to a kind of an a profile uh it might reflect the fact that you need a little bit more lung recruitment on that side but the point mm -hmm. against it is that when you go to l4 which is posterior mm -hmm. you've got an absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful a line normal appearance so the posterior part of the lungs are well recruited there are a few comet tails at the top mm. i think what this case basically highlights again from our perspective is the variation in the different areas of the lung and why it's so important for you to look at those individual areas uh through basically longitudinal scanning very carefully because you can pick up small areas of consolidation that might reflect now if 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 l3 had that area of atelectasis uh with a a totally broken pleura uh or a shred sign in elevated crp then i'd be thinking about the possibility of an amonic consolidation okay so let's okay. go to the next set of images yeah to the right lung yeah in l2 so Yeah. Do you think that on the left side there's also some loss of contact because when I did for extreme preterms with that linear probe mm. toward the lower side there was always not enough chest space to accommodate that and I had this blackouts. Uh, it's unusual if you have a linear probe that's nice and long you should be able to cover the entire chest of a extremely preterm baby uh with uh, even a single scan. So maybe when we we talk on Tuesday we can have a look at how you're doing it okay okay go for it mayank okay very nice so in Beautiful. the r1 uh, area i can see uh, almost uh, 
a little bit of irregularity in some parts of the pleural uh, is in some parts of the lung but mostly the pleural line appears to be normal and sliding well i can appreciate uh, a lines as well as b lines and these uh, b lines are more than three in a single space so i would classify again as uh, ab profile uh, but i do not find any consolidation as such or any effusion so coming to the r2 uh, area uh, again, the pleural line is uh, well demarcated and sliding well, and this is predominantly uh, A profile, and I feel that these are some comet tail artifacts. Coming to the R3 uh, reason, so I can appreciate uh, the pleural line, however, th these uh, are not demarcated well, but these are sliding okay, and the uh, this dominance of B lines. So I would classify this as B profile uh, without any consultation as such. And uh, in the R4 uh, region, I can appreciate that again, uh, the pleural line is okay, looks normal to me and sliding well, but these are again dominated by B lines and I would classify this as B profile and I can see an area of consultation, uh, subpleural consultation in one of the root spaces. Sure. Excellent. So what you're classically seeing from R1 to R4 is just classical lung transition. Now, clearly from our perspective, when you look at R1, uh, you've got an element of the upper half of the lung field being uh, B dominant, lower half of the lung field kind of having A lines. Yeah. So this basically is it is a double lung point uh, and uh, classically from our perspective, it's it's a, it's a marker of transitioning lung. Uh, the reason I would not call this transient tachypnea of the newborn is because of the history that you've given me. So some mm -hmm. babies, again, you know, who've had therapeutic hypothermia can have an element of uh, wetness because uh, they have interstitial edema, secondary to surfactantin activation. And that might also be the reason why in R4 you see that subtural consolidation because your argument would mm -hmm. be, well, this is a baby from our perspective who, you know, shouldn't have RDS, but when you look at R3 and R4 mm -hmm. and you kind of wonder, and I think what you're again seeing is a baby who has delayed perinatal adaptation where the transition of the lung fluid is basically taking more time because the baby's had therapeutic hypothermia and has basically got fluid retention, possibly an element of surfactant inactivation, but gravity dependent accumulation of fluid, which means that the R3 and R4 regions are B profile dominant. Now, what is very important, and this is uh, one thing I'd like to highlight, I'm spending a little bit more time on the review, is if you look at R3 and R4, the plural line is regular throughout. Can you see that? It's mm -hmm. regular throughout. Now, can we go back to your mm -hmm. previous slide, please? Okay. Now, if you could just press on L3, L3. So you've pressed on L3. Now, what I'd say is you have plural in the lower half. So you can just put your marker on the pleura in the lower half. Okay. Now, why do I think that there's atelectasis in the upper half? Is because the pleura has completely disappeared. So upper half, go to the upper half, Mayank. Yeah. The pleura has completely disappeared. But more importantly, what I've got is a complete whiteout zone over here. Uh, no air bronchograms. Uh, you know, there's no fluid bronchograms. And a complete area of opacification with what has consolidation at the top. So for me, this mm. would go more in favor of atelectasis as compared to just pure consolidation. But the important marker here is you can't see plura at all. Mm. Right. So that's great. Well done. Uh, uh, is Naz uh, on? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, Naz, uh, I'm gonna, I made you co-host. So Mike, can I ask you to stop sharing and we're gonna get Nas to yeah. present some cases. I think if you look at the entire uh, kind of uh, ethos of uh, kind of uh, the presentation at this particular point, it's so beautiful to be able to see these images, but what I'm going to emphasize to you is the importance of taking history clinical correlation. So none of the images in that last baby had any evidence of shred sign, irregular kind of pleura was seen in certain areas. It was more blurred than irregular. And blurring is a very common sign seen with fluid. So again, you know, if you've got irregular pleura, which is broken with a shred sign, you need to think possibly an infective cause. You can also see it with BPD. Go for it, Naz. 
Okay, I am sorry, I am not um, as organized as my aunt is, so I'm just going to present my case and I'll show you. And um, please critique. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, so this is a term baby, a 37 uh, weeker who was um, born by um, spontaneous vaginal delivery, um, no risk factors or sepsis apart from meconium stained like at delivery. Um, baby actually was a good weight, three kilos, born in good condition, cried at birth, no resuscitation required. And at two hours of age was noted to be hypothermic um, with a temperature of 35.8 and also um, floppy. And when the neonatal team went, the baby was working hard, had subcostal intercostal recessions, um, and had, was sinus and had a SATS of 74%. So it's got a neonatal unit, initially put it on a vapor therm of eight liters and then changed to CPAP. So this is the X-ray on CPAP. Um, and as you can see, um, it's an AP view of the baby being supine. You can see the NG in situ and you can see multiple infiltrates bilaterally and no sign of pneumothorax on the X-ray. The um, gases showed um, persistent respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Um, and the baby was in 100% oxygen with no pre and post ductal difference. So we- uh, Age of the baby now is at this X-ray? Um, so three hours. Three hours, thank you, sorry. Um, no, it's fine. Um, so um, we intubated the baby and ventilated the baby and um, with required around TTV of six mils per kilo with using pressures of around 30 to 35 to achieve the tidal volume of six mils per kilo in 100% oxygen. So then had to go on nitric and get transferred out. Um, so this doesn't show much of the lungs and I have another x-ray, but as you can see, it's got a lot of patchy white infiltrates on the exit it was mainly done for um, the UVC, which we were putting in at that point. Um, but I have uh, another x-ray, which you can see where the baby's been intubated. So this was around four hours of age. Um, and you can see um, it, the heart ward is pretty much not visible as such. And they're just multiple patchy um, infiltrates uh, in this baby. Um, interestingly, um, post ventilation and um, achieving a tidal volume of six mils per kilo, baby saturating around 92% in 100% oxygen. Um, the gas actually significantly better. We started off with a pH of less than seven with a PCO2 of 12. We were now pH of 7.28 with a PCO2 of six point something. And, but the oxygenation index was 20. So the PO2 remained quite low um, persistently, which, uh, so there was clearly some uh, VQ mismatch going yeah. on. Um, I'll go through the um, X, uh, the ultrasounds, which uh, are not great, but um, you can have a look. Um, so this is the R1, um, and you can see the pleura, I think, sliding really well. Um, I could not, there are some A lines seen over here, uh, and there are lots of B lines visible. Um, uh, I can't. Yep, that's that's a very so. First of all, very nice image in that you've got three ribs that are visible. You've got two intercostal spaces, so beautiful. Uh, this is the right or the left lung? The right. The right lung. So what you've got is a plural margin that is thick. It's blurred. Uh, classically, from your perspective, you can see A lines, but then you can see what is a very wet appearance, especially if you look at the upper half of that lung. So, if we just play the image again, I mean, I'd say that the, the upper half of the lung is completely beat out with just marginal A lines at this particular point. But classically, this is after intubation, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, you've been able to aerate the right uh, lower part of the lung as you move down. And what you can see actually is this transition zone between the left and the right lung. You have rules sliding throughout. So if we just play it again, so you can see the lower half of the lung having rules sliding with a B line even in the lower half of the lung. Now, this is obviously anterior. So clearly it's less wet. So we can go to your next image. Um, Very nice image. Really? Uh, because I don't have any presets. So I just used. Uh, in lung, which was there on a preset, which I'm not it's, even sure exactly. What. It's it's giving us all the information we need. 
So it's a good image uh, in terms of kind of your delineation. Superficial structures are visualized very nicely. Plural margin is visualized very nicely. What we've obviously got is when we've taken the depth in, we've got a little bit of artifact at the bottom, but that's not a problem. Thank you. Um, and then this is our two. Very nice. So again, you can see the lung sliding over here and you can see lots of B lines over there. Um, and I think this was the um, liver shadow which is yep. coming up. Correct. So again, what where, if you just play it again, just for a sec. So what I'd say is that again, going in order, so focusing on the plura, this plural sliding, the margin of the plura here definitely looks sharper as compared to the previous image. You've got some comet tails at the top, but uh, what you've got is an A profile at the top and can you see the bottom? So if you just take your arrow to the complete opacified bottom. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's an area of consolidation. And it's just reflective of an area of lung that's not been uh, recruited. Do we know what the CRP on this baby was? Less than five. Less than five. At the, first one, the first one, sure, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I think, I mean, for me, the plural line uh, looks pretty smooth over here. This is a dominant A profile. So you've recruited a lot of the lung, but you've definitely got an area of consolidation uh, at that portion below which is deep consolidation. It's not superficial consolidation. Uh, again, the question from our perspective is this would need further follow-up. I mean, is this an area patchy atelectasis where your endotracheal tube wasn't down the right side, was it? First. No, in fact, no, in fact, it was it, the, the, the X ratio is exactly where we left it. So it's quite high up actually at sure. T2, P1, sure. T2 actually. So again, what I'd say is in babies who are intubated to see consolidation atelectasis on the right side immediately after intubation, just uh, might prompt you to have a look and see where your tube is, just because you might be collapse, collapsing the upper segmental lobe. Can we go back to your last image? So again, just uh, now that I've seen the previous image, that, that lower half of this zone, that is consolidation. So would that reflect it? Because this baby had clearly meconium aspiration. Yeah, um, yeah. it's patchy consolidation. So what meconium aspiration classically presents with, and this is why the history is so important, is areas of variable consolidation without demarcation in different areas. So like a classical mnemonic kind of a consolidation or what is called a trans lobar consolidation uh, occupies a defined anatomic lobar zone. So when, we, when, you, when you read the chapter on consolidation, you find I've classified them into Translobar, non-lobar consolidation. And meconium aspiration classically presents with uh, the absence of lobar or patterned consolidation in particular areas. It presents with patchy consolidation. And the reason you get an A profile is because you get air trapped in areas beyond the areas of chemical pneumonitis to start off with. I mean, an expectation from my perspective when I had a look at that first chest X-ray is to kind of find a complete B whiteout kind of appearance. But what you're giving me here is basically a very patchy appearance with an upper zone of the lung, which has A and consolidation. And if it has this kind of a distribution, which is very mixed, this is very classical for meconium aspiration. No shred sign, no irregularities of the pleura goes against a kind of a mnemonic kind of a presentation. And what you'll find is that actually uh, you might, if you had gone up on pressures, being able to recruit more lung, which might mean that, you know, if you did do this uh, maybe a few hours later, after giving surfactant or putting pressures up, you might find that the pattern of consolidation has changed completely disappeared. So this is both surfactant, sorry. Um... Okay. Fair. So it might mean that you might have had significant consolidation, which is improved in the upper half. So, but it, it's a very, very nice example of the fact that there is a complete non lobar consolidation. Carry on. Lovely images. So, I mean, what I'd say is that all images give you information. Now, you're going to the dependent portion of the lung. So, you're going to R3. This may be supine, right? Yeah, it's very supine. Yeah. Um, so again over here you can see the lung sliding but the pleura looks quite thick I don't know whether it's 
uh, this over there and there's no i mean there's some a lines but not many it's more for b lines yeah yeah compact b lines is the word we'd use over here so the b lines have all completely uh, coalesced and clearly from our perspective what you've got is a compact b line appearance again multiple patterns here in different parts of the lung so we'll go to the next one um, and then coming to the left side um so that's the l1 mm. so again very very uh complete b profile very irregular pleural line at this particular point might reflect the fact that you have subpleural consolidations and uh, that would probably be reflective of trap meconium causing sub pleural consolidations often distally you can sometimes see deeper consolidation like you saw in the first bit so is it these ones like yes these are subpleural consolidations and they basically reflect that you've got meconium in the airways which are causing the consolidation of that part of the lung and can i ask so like you can see the pleura over here so well and over here and it seems to kind of disappear over here um is that because i've lost contact or uh, so it could be i don't think you've lost contact because i can see the ribs and you've got them at 90 degrees my gut feeling is you've probably got an element of atelectasis there because you don't have much air in that zone and so the pleural line is completely disappeared so it's very dense but you can see the pleural line at the bottom i don't think i think you've got good contact it's just a lack of aeration we'll talk about that um and then at l2 again again lots yeah lots similar. of subpleural consolidation air a lines trapping uh, you got b lines in the upper zone so if you just point to the big b line that you have in the upper zone beautiful yeah and again the pleura is very irregular in that particular zone whereas it's pretty regular in the middle so it's a very patchy kind of a clinical picture not giving you a typical pattern i think the classical history that you have is the fact that you've got meconium in the background uh and uh, uh i mean the clinical uh, did you have chronic skin staining nail staining was this um just uh um... Uh, umbilical cord that's it nothing else it's not um, and it was just thin meconium not thick meconium um, and i think that's the reason why the baby didn't require resuscitation initially but then collapsed late a couple of hours later so um, yeah uh, what i would also say is that with meconium aspiration just be aware again you can't see shred sign in any of these which i'll show you with mnemonic presentation but uh, one of the key things that you might have to differentiate when you have more of a kind of a bronchopneumonia kind of clinical picture is you can get similar patterns but what you'll get is subpleural kind of areas of complete breakdown where you can see no pleura at all and uh, as opposed to thinking of atelectasis if it's irregular and you can see a hypolucent region below it that's classically called shred sign and that goes more in favor of mnemonic consolidation but those kind of mnemonic consolidations present exactly like this with multiple different patterns we call them a c profile or a consolidation pattern that's very good i think both uh, our uh, colleagues have shown us some very nice images today again my take home message for all of you would be clinical correlation and uh, i think uh, what i'd say is the only thing that uh, is very important in situations like this is the importance of using uh, the same probe or transducer if you're deciding that you want to do follow up because clearly if you use different transducers as I'll show you you might find that the actual interpretation of what you can see then changes especially if you're trying to differentiate the degree of interstitial edema on an x-ray with different pathologies so i will share my screen is my screen visible yes okay so what we are going to talk about today is the pure basics i mean i think from our perspective uh, you can all see the slide show now yeah yes excellent so i mean some of you who have previous experience with lung ultrasound kind of 
will have a little bit of a head start in your ability to be able to use machines, make interpretations. But clearly what we're doing is we're really starting our journey today with what these different things that we talk about, A lines, B lines, compact B lines, consolidation uh, actually mean. But before we actually do that, what is very important is that we have a very good handle of the basic principles of ultrasound, but more importantly, uh, why and how we find these different artifacts on lung ultrasound. Because once you know that, A, you will be able to understand what uh, the different lung artifacts are, but more importantly, the different differentials of lung artifacts can often confuse you. And people often get confused between comet tails, bee lines. Uh, people get confused between what is the ring down artifact. And there's a little bit of difference between uh, adult literature and the literature as described by uh, certainly our colleagues, uh, Dr. Liu and uh, Dr. Raimondi as to what the pathophysiology is for these different artifacts in neonates. Now, a very simple, simple approach uh, in lung ultrasound is basically first kind of having a little bit of an idea about what lung ultrasound actually is, but before that, how ultrasound is actually used. Now, whenever we use an ultrasound probe, what we're basically looking to do is deliver ultrasound waves. And these waves will basically interact with the surface of uh, the area that you're scanning and then the tissue beneath it. So kind of the surface here and the tissue beneath it and then deeper tissue. And clearly from our perspective, what we then are looking at is an image generated by the waves that are reflected back. So reflection is the foremost mechanism of giving us images when we perform ultrasound. The ultrasound waves are classically defined as uh, frequencies of over 20,000 Hertz. So kind of beyond the human hearing range, but clearly what they are are mechanical waves that are generated by a piezoelectric crystal, which basically enter into the surface and tissue, uh, interact with the tissue, are reflected back and then have a variety of different interactions that I'm gonna talk about which when reflected back into the ultrasound probe are then used to generate an image. And clearly the human body, as we know, is a mixture of different tissues, but outside the human body, we clearly have air. And air unfortunately forms an, uh, kind of a, uh, an interface through which ultrasound waves will not be able to pass. So if you have air in any interface, uh, which you're trying to ultrasound, like if you have subcutaneous emphysema with a lung ultrasound, actually you might not be able to see anything below that. And this is a very important concept because for decades it's been thought that actually you couldn't do lung ultrasound because the lungs are full of air. But actually what we know is that when we apply uh, a, a transducer or an ultrasound to any organ, the waves that are generated go into that soft tissue, get reflected back and to a great extent, uh, you know, what we're basically looking at is an image which basically is seen, which a lot of people correlate with the anatomy of what is being kind of seen. So the kidney here, and this is the kidney here, and this is the anatomy of the kidney. But actually with the lung, unfortunately, what we're not looking at in entirety is the anatomy, maybe some of the superficial structures up to the pleura, but a lot of the other aspects of lung ultrasound are basically uh, interpreted through artifact. And uh, it's quite interesting how most ultrasound machines are designed on the principle that if artifact is generated, they should be minimized. So the classical images that you used to get with the uh, old machines, which used to produce a lot of artifact, are something that are kind of filtered out in newer machines. And that's made diagnostic interpretation a little bit more difficult for us. But any ultrasound machine will basically help convert ultrasound reflected waves from an organ or tissue into an image which we can see on our screen. And what we would be interpreting on lung ultrasound is actually the interaction of not just the tissue, but the artifact and making an interpretation of that artifact to kind of try and determine what we think is right or wrong with the lungs. Now, frequency is a very, very important aspect of lung ultrasound and ultrasound per se. And I'm going to keep this as simple as possible. So. I don't expect you to remember this. Some of you might feel quite confused by some of the concepts we discussed today. We will be doing it again. You know, for those of you who feel more kind of need for a little bit more detailed kind of overview of lung ultrasound, you can join us on Thursday. But 
at the end of the day, what I'd say is that when you kind of look at frequencies, uh, you have high and low frequency. And frequency represents the sound speed. So the sound waves are basically emitted at a certain speed by the transducer. And a good example of you know a low frequency is kind of a clap. Uh, so the clap is made, uh, it, it goes to a wall, reflects back, and that echo basically reflects the reflected wave, which is what the ultrasound generates into an image. But if you look at frequency, a high frequency would be rapid clapping. But a single clap or a loud clap might reflect a low frequency. And clearly, whatever uh, sound wave is generated, it then has to travel a certain distance, which is what we call wavelength. And it's this interaction that basically helps us determine how far we're going to be able to penetrate into any tissue. So what you can see from our perspective is that when you use a higher frequency, the actual time or interval between sound waves is reduced. So you're able to basically bombard uh, a lot of sound waves in a shorter period of time, uh, but they will travel a shorter distance. Uh, the attenuation, uh, so when you have a high frequency probe and you use it, the attenuation of sound waves is higher. Whereas if you look at a low frequency probe, you're able to use a lower frequency, which basically means you're generating uh, less sound waves, which have less attenuation. So they can actually travel a longer distance. And this brings us to the concept of when we use high frequencies, we tend to be able to see the superficial structures much better. And hence the kind of concept for using high frequency kind of uh, uh, I would say hurts in uh, lung ultrasound, especially for extremely preterm and preterm babies, because you really want to be able to focus at the level of the pleural line and superficial structures as opposed to the deeper structures. But as you can see, if you're looking for deep consolidations, that might need a little bit of fiddling around. At the end of the day, image generation is not just uh, a a a I would say equation that involves the generation of sound waves and reflection back. There is a lot of things that's happening to the sound waves that we're going to subsequently discuss. So the expectation when an ultrasound wave interacts with tissue, and this is heart tissue that you can see over here, is that we will get a beautiful image which is uniformly uh, symmetrical, that has normal dimensions, and that gives us the anatomy and structure in complete flawless uh, kind of, uh, visibility, but clearly what you see when it's translated into the image is basically areas that look bright, that are hyper equic, that obviously are perpendicular to the beam, whereas other areas that look less bright, you know, the more lateral you are because we're having issues with uh, specular reflection. Uh, so, and then you've got areas which look quite hypo equic, clearly because they're isodense and there's nowhere for the sound waves to reflect against them. And that is generating your image, but in your mind, what you expect to see sometimes is very different from what the ultrasound image actually shows. And you have got to kind of then make an interpretation of that image, taking all these factors into account. Now, the ultrasound machine, unfortunately, does not have a brain. So it assumes that waves travel in straight lines. It assumes that when a wave is generated, it will hit a structure, come back to you uh, vertically. Uh, it will assume that actually and the sound beam that it's giving, which is kind of a linear beam, comes back as a linear beam and comes back 100%. Uh, it basically assumes that it travels at the same speed through the structure uh, so that the footprint throughout is completely the same. And basically any sound wave going perpendicular to the probe returns back with the shortest possible path. Uh, the detected echo deepest takes a longer time to come back to the probe. In reality, actually, if you look at the heart, you've got the left ventricular cavity with blood inside, with papillary muscles, clearly with different areas of tissue uh, depth and density. And really what is happening is you have issues, not just of uh, reflection back, but you have reflection back at different angles from different surfaces. When you enter into the blood, you have different densities between the tissue in the left ventricle and the blood in the intraventricular cavity. Uh, you have reflections along and scattering along these uh, kind of uh, the blood that's traversing through. And clearly, uh, if the blood is of one density, you're not going to have much reflection, which is why you have a hypoechoic view. And exactly the same is happening at the level of the lung. So while 
reflection is one aspect and reflection is the major aspect of how we generate an image. What is happening is that you, you have images that are sent by a transducer. It gives you uh, 100%. It expects 100%, but because of issues with bone, the ribs, because of issues with fluid in the interstitial space, you have concepts of scattering. When you have a rib, you basically have no sound waves going through, which kind of means that you have shadows behind the ribs. But more importantly, you know, if you have a mnemonic kind of a consolidation with complete breakdown of lung tissue, there's going to be differences in density between the tissue around that area and the tissue within. Now that will result in sound waves going in, but not coming out, which is, it's called absorption. And then again, as you go towards deeper tissue, because we use high frequency probes, the higher the frequency, the sound wave basically, as it goes through, it gets absorbed by tissue, gets reflected by bones. So what you have is this concept of attenuation. But at the end of the day, this sound wave also has to pass through skin, fat. I mean, if you look at me and you try to do a lung ultrasound on me, I'm, I'm not a, a, a very lean, thin person. I have a lot of fat. So it becomes more difficult if you have a lot of fat uh, because you're going through different kind of densities of tissue. That also results in problems with attenuation and the lack of being able to see. But more importantly, as you go through different tissue densities, like if you go, say, for example, from fat to soft tissue uh, and from soft tissue to liquid, what you get is this concept of refraction. So the anatomy uh, can be quite, uh, I would say, uh, changed. And that's, it's, it's all of these things that eventually produce artifacts. And it is this interaction of all of these things that we then interpret as A, B, lines, as well as other artifacts like comet tails and ring down artifacts. Now, why does this happen? Why do we have this problem? And the reason that we have this problem is because we have different density between tissues in the chest. So the skin, followed by soft tissue, adipose layer, followed by muscle, followed by bone, followed by lung, pleura, followed by tissue, all have different impedance. And this difference in the physical characteristics between all of these layers uh, in the chest is known as acoustic impedance. Now, the higher the acoustic impedance between the applied transducer and the surface to which it's being applied or between two different areas or zones through which the sound wave is having to penetrate, the higher the amount of sound energy reflected back. So a very good example from our perspective is uh, bone. So when you look at bone, and I'll show you some images, what you can clearly see is the ribs. If you try to put uh, ultrasound, you, you have an area behind that which looks completely dark and without any features, featureless. And that is because virtually 100% of the, uh, the, the sound waves that are hitting that bone are being reflected back. On the other hand, uh, the area in between which has skin, has adipose tissue, muscle, actually has uh, less density and actually forms a good propagating kind of uh, surface for sound waves to move more quickly, for penetration to not take place uh, in a uniform manner. And that gives us the best window for performing lung ultrasound. So really when we're doing longitudinal lung ultrasound, what we're trying to do is basically interpret the regions between the ribs to be able to give us the best interpretation. Now, Classical areas where uh, you have uh, air. So if you have air between this, this transducer and the surface. So a good example from my perspective is if you, if you just put a transducer on without any fluid, there's going to be no interface that's going to help sound waves propagate into tissue. And what you get is this completely dense black area. So you can't see anything. And that is the reason why we put gel between the actual probe and the margin or the skin. It's to basically produce an interface of fluid, which will allow the sound waves to propagate through. And what they're actually doing from our perspective is uh, in producing a caustic impedance by introducing uh, two different uh, kind of uh, tissue densities at that particular point. If you don't have tissue density, then you classically have what is called just a hypoechoic kind of an area. And this is basically a cyst. It's also called the cyst sign. So if you look at this, this is a sector probe. And the sector probe is gonna give ultrasound waves in all this direction. Now, clearly this is the area nearest. It's also an area of increased density where there's a large difference between the acoustic impedance of the fluid or the gel that's allowing these probes to come in, which is causing reflectivity. 
And that reflection going back is producing a bright area over here. This would be the, you know, the Pluto would appear like this. It's linear, it's hyper equic. Uh, a very similar kind of an appearance uh, you would see, uh, say for example, if you, if you wanted to look at the uh, pericardial margin when you have kind of a pericardial effusion. But if you look at the deeper structure, the cyst, there's actually no change in the density of the fluid within the cyst except some septa margins. So you've got lung ultrasound waves which are basically penetrating through, which aren't showing any reflection. They're not showing any significant refraction. They're not showing any scattering. And hence what you see is basically this hypoechoic area over here. Now, the higher the acoustic impedance uh, or the difference in acoustic impedance between two interfaces, the higher the amount of uh, reflection, and that actually produces what we call is a hyperechoic kind of a clinical picture. But more importantly, if there's an acoustic impedance difference between two areas and tissue can penetrate, uh, sound waves can penetrate the tissue, that allows a good medium for us to be able to kind of uh, do lung ultrasound as well. If you have very, very high bone bright kind of acoustic impedance, so 4080, uh, the density of bone being very high, uh, basically all the sound waves reflect back, nothing can penetrate through the bone and the, the area behind that is completely dark. On the other hand, if you look at air and fat, they have a, a very low acoustic impedance. Uh, so, you know, from our perspective, air has uh, a kind of a, uh, virtually nothing, it won't allow the penetration of sound waves at all. But if you add water to this or gel, say for example, it improves and creates a uh, a kind of an acoustic impedance which allows sound waves to penetrate through, uh, which allows us to then interrogate deeper structures. So it's a very, very important concept. Uh, sound wave propagation is a very important aspect of being able to see deeper structures. So again, a, a very important concept from our perspective is that if you have bone and you put uh, a sound wave through it, because bone will reflect the majority of your sound waves back 99%, you're not going to be able to integrate the, the deeper structures. But another very important concept is attenuation. And what I would say is that as sound waves penetrate and go deeper in, they lose energy because of absorption of these sound waves by the different tissues that you see in that particular area. And actually what you find is that the images become less bright. Now, if I, if I talk about all these things and how we apply that to lung ultrasound. So first of all, we've already discussed that there are multiple interfaces through which sound has to penetrate. But if you have air in any of those interfaces, a good example is subcutaneous emphysema in a baby with an omothorax. You might find that you actually put the probe there and you can't see anything underneath. And that the reason for that is air basically has, uh, you know, uh, has blocked the ability of uh, any ability for the sound waves to propagate through it as a medium. On the other hand, if you then apply gel to a surface, say for example, you, you actually improve the ability for sound waves to propagate through that area and able to see the deeper structures. So these are all concepts that are linked to the, the concepts that we've just discussed. I'm gonna skip propagation viscosity because it's not very, very important. But what I would like to cover is these five concepts and these are very, very, very important because they give us they give us the idea of why we see a lines why we see b lines and how we interpret b lines going up in density so we've already talked about the concept of reflection and reflection basically means that if you are in a situation where you give uh, a put a probe on tissue you generate a, an ultrasound sound wave the sound wave being reflected back, interpreted uh, by the ultrasound probe, basically generates an image. Now, the fact is that's what the ultrasound probe and machine assume. The problem is that as we as as we do ultrasound, tissues tend to absorb energy from the sound waves, and the sound wave as it goes and goes in deeper, you get attenuation. The sound wave basically becomes less strong. And actually reflections also become less strong because of this for that very reason. And a good example of that is A-lines. So if that's the skin and this is the pleural margin, when the pleural margin being superficial has uh, ultrasound waves hit it, those margins uh, basically cause uh, being a flat perpendicular surface, reflection back, 
and the outermost margin causes a lot of reflection, but actually you have tissue below the pleural margin and the tissue below the pleural margin absorbs those sound waves. And clearly when you have that, you have what we call as reverberations. Now the A lines, as you see are parallel lines, and sometimes what you see is they actually get less intense as you go into the lung. And that is classically because of the concept of attenuation. Again, clearly absorption contributes to attenuation, but it basically reflects tissues around absorbing sound waves uh, energy, making the sound wave less strong as it goes in. Scattering basically is a very, very important concept. And what it basically means is that when you have lung tissue, and if this is the pleural margin, the pleural margin basically has uh, bones above it, uh, lung uh, sound waves coming through it, but it has fluid. And fluid basically occurs in the form of very small bubbles in the interstitial spaces. And these bubbles, basically, as we know, we talked about uh, fluid being uh, a, a reflector. Uh, a very good reflector. And clearly when, when bubbles, which are less, uh, I would say linear than as compared to the plural margin reflect, they reflect in different directions. And we call this scattering. Now, when you reflect in different directions, if you have fluid all the way around, you'll have reflections in between the fluid particles as well. And this is basically what helps us generate B lines. I'll talk about refraction a little bit later. Now, attenuation is an important concept. Because clearly what we found is that the higher the frequency of the sound wave you use, uh, the more the attenuation that you see. And that then means the deeper structures with a higher frequency are obviously less well-defined. And hence, you know, uh, if you want to focus on the superficial structures, say in the chest or extremely preterm babies, we tend to use uh, higher frequency probes. But if you have a very big baby, say for example, who's got the corner mass aspiration, you want to look for deeper consolidations, you might have to lose uh, a slightly lower frequency to get uh, less attenuation so that the sound waves can penetrate deeper to give you a better, much better kind of a, a view. Attenuation is basically, uh, it's, it, it's an equation which involves uh, three things. It involves the distance traveled by the ultrasound wave, the frequency of the ultrasound probe, and a coefficient, which is called the attenuation coefficient. Now, clearly, uh, what you can see from our perspective is that uh, as, uh, as, as uh, you go through denser tissue, uh, you tend to have more attenuation in the sound waves. And this is a very, very important concept. Again, what, what it shows is that if you use uh, this high frequency probes, there's higher attenuation. And hence, the importance of being and using the appropriate frequency. You, now, frequencies as used in extremely preterm babies might be higher than those used in term babies, but standard recommendations by Liu and David Kiripa basically recommend starting with a frequency of above eight. So generally between nine and 12, either using the linear transducer or the hockey stick probe. Uh, there is always, because bone has higher density, greater attenuation behind bone. So really what you want to do if you're trying to look at the lungs, and that is why we do longitudinal scanning is you're going to get a larger area of tissue to be able to see because you're seeing multiple intercostal spaces between the ribs. Now, as I've said, ideally what you want is three ribs, two intercostal spaces. But if you want to say, look for a deeper consolidation between two ribs, what you're going to have to do is what is classically called as transverse scanning between each rib space. Now, if you're doing transverse scanning and you're looking uh, for a consolidation in a big term baby, you might have to use a slightly lower frequency to be able to see a consolidation better. If you look at the back of babies, uh, in particular, if you're doing the upper back where the scapula is present, it can be a, a, you know, an area that creates quite a significant acoustic shadow. And this acoustic shadow is what uh, you saw in Mayank's kind of images when you looked at the back. So being exactly perpendicular, but medial to the scapula and basically making sure that you've got good contact is a very important aspect of getting good images on the back. So you can see how attenuation has a significant clinical significance. But just to give you an idea, these are two convex probes used in an adult. And clearly what you can see is that, uh, you know, when you use a lower frequency, 
The deeper structures a little bit better defined, but clearly the most superficial kind of structures, emanation of the B lines, which are better seen by a high frequency probe because they're closer to the plural margin, are actually uh, better defined by using the higher frequency probe as well as the A lines. Now, if you looked at this particular image and you looked at a baby who had significant respiratory distress, really what you might be thinking as uh, is a normal A profile with a completely linear plural margin, but actually this plural margin is a little bit blurred and there is a B profile in the lower part. So again, what I'd emphasize is that small differences in uh, probe frequency can actually make a significant difference to how you interpret the clinical findings. And with time, when you use your probes, you will get used to being able to see probes and make clinical interpretations which need to take these limitations into account and need to clinically correlate. I cannot emphasize that enough. These are adults, hence the frequency is being lower. But I think I've emphasized the point that, you know, differences in frequency uh, are very important when you're looking at the actual lung ultrasound. We've talked about absorption. Just a very important concept before I go on to uh, very quickly wanting to look at how we generate different aspects of uh, uh, A and B lines is what we call as reflection, specular reflection and diffuse reflection. So as I discussed with you, when you have uh, sound waves penetrating using an ultrasound probe that move onto a uniform linear surface, obviously what will happen is the sound waves will be reflected back perpendicular and uh, in a manner that probably gives you a stronger signal because uh, uh, there's less attenuation. On the other hand, if you have an irregular kind of a surface that the sound waves are having to penetrate through or tissue that is basically got, uh, as uh, you can see, uh, lots of fluid bubbles in it, that is uh, a zone uh, distal to the pleura, then there is what you call diffuse reflection. Now, clearly with diffuse reflection, what you're going to have is more attenuation, but you will have sound images going in different directions. And this is called diffuse reflection. Now, what is the significance of this? So if you assume this is the pleura, then the pleura gives you a nice linear sharp shadow because the linear probes are sending, uh, I would say, uh, sound waves that are reflected back in a perpendicular manner right back, which give the straight pattern. But if you look at B lines in particular, what you've classically got is the concept of uh, diffuse reflection. Now, the more you have in terms of interstitial fluid and bubbles and tetrahedrons, and I'll explain that, the worse the diffuse reflection. And the diffuse reflection then produces uh, areas of internal reflection and refraction which then produces what we call as reverberations within the tissue. And it is this reverberation that actually ends up producing what we call are the beeline artifacts if they are vertical. So again, I've talked about the pleura. I've talked about diffuse reflection. I mean, I'm going to skip these slides. What I'd like to emphasize is that if you look at pleura, you'll get a, a nice linear kind of a reflective kind of line. The A lines will give you similar kind of a pattern, but because of attenuation, you might see that they actually disappear or become less prominent as you move deeper into the lung. But a good example is when you do cranial ultrasound. If you look at the surface of the brain, quite irregular. It's a very bright sulcal guidal appearance, but actually if you go into the deeper structures of the brain, you have a lot of different echoes, which then produce what we call our individual intricacies of the anatomy. Uh, dots, which basically reflect the corpus callosum, which reflect the ventricular surface. Again, the ventricles being fluid, the density being same, you, they replant as a relatively hypoechoic area. So there are very important concepts which are going to give rise to the different, I would say, kind of lines that you see. So the pleura will give a linear margin, whereas if you look at the brain, the speckled kind of echoes that are produced, the scatter that produces gives a more defined kind of an anatomical kind of uh, view of the brain. Uh, now, non-perpendicular reflection is a very, very important aspect of specular reflection. Now, coming back to Mayank's kind of initial lung ultrasound, if you're perpendicular to the lung, you're going to get waves which basically come back to you with higher intensity because you're going to get less attenuation. And the 
other aspect is these waves which come back, they're being generated by the transducer as a whole. So they're coming back to the transducer as a whole. And hence the image being generated is more uniform. It's more in parallel. But if you're not perpendicular, then what you are going to get is you're going to get refraction. You're going to get images which aren't reflected exactly back to the transducer. You're going to get more attenuation. And actually what will happen is your image quality will suffer. So it's very important that when you're doing lung ultrasound, you are keeping the reflective surface of the probe in contact, perpendicular, and trying to make sure that it is kept in a manner that's not applying too much pressure to the baby. The, the more pressure you apply, the more pain, the more the baby will struggle. And you'll find the baby will try and avoid the surface of the probe. Try and optimize that. Especially when you're looking at the upper back in a baby, as I emphasized, who's prone. The back tends to slope down. Again, when you go into the axilla or a baby who's supine, there's a sloping towards the axilla. And what you might want to do just to get that straight is put a small towel underneath just to make that, that area uh, a little bit more, I would say, horizontal for you to be able to get better contact. So you can see how the ultrasound wave reflected at an angle because you're not perpendicular is not going to come back. That's going to mean that you're going to get less intense images, less, uh, you know, uh, I would say there's, there's an element of artifact that you can actually miss if that's the case. What is important is that your angle of insulation is always kept at 90 degrees. Uh, if you if you look at how that translates into the appearance, so you can see if it's kept at 90 degrees, a very nice image is obtained with a very nice clear plural margin. But more importantly, what you can see is you can see all the lung artifacts. Now, clearly, when you, you look at the ribs, as I said, there is going to be a lot of reflection from the ribs back. So what you get is this classical appearance of an acoustic shadow behind the ribs. But the intercostal space in between has these multiple areas, skin, uh, adipose tissue, muscle, pleural line. And the pleural line being linear and bright has a high reflectivity. Again, the acoustic impedance, uh, the difference between what is fat adipose tissue and the pleura of the lung is quite high, which is why the pleura appears so bright. But more importantly, uh, as you go into the lung, what you can see is the B lines appear less bright because sound waves are gradually becoming attenuated. Uh, if, you, if you look at A-lines, they, they sometimes go back down. Uh, if you have what is classically a B-profile, again, what you can see is superficial structures of the line being brighter. But as you go in, the, the density of the image goes on going down. And that's all a reflection of the properties that we've just discussed. I'm going to skip refraction. It's not really very relevant. But really, what I'm going to do is summarize exactly what the ultrasound probe is trying to do. It's trying to replicate this anatomy in a manner that it thinks it will, but actually what is happening is a combination of all of these things, that's scatter, uh, that is reflection, that is attenuation, uh, produces images that then create what we would say is an ultrasound image, which is seen in two dimensions. Now, all of these things have an effect. And clearly, if you look at say a sector scan, a sector scan will go kind of uh, in directions that basically mean the, the sound waves are not quite parallel, they're, they're going uh, laterally. Now clearly, when you look at the heart in this particular area, because of attenuation of sound waves, because it's having to pass through a lot of this tissue, as opposed to passing through fluid and blood, you have areas of dropout. Now this is classically an attenuation artifact. Whereas the perpendicular areas, as you can see, are bright. That's because you have better reflection from these areas. But in particular, because there's no change in the density of blood within the left ventricular cavity, this looks hypoechoic. So I hope I've kind of made a point of how the interaction of the different uh, kind of uh, properties of ultrasound waves help to produce an ultrasound image. With that in mind, what is normal lung appearance and how is it generated? So this is, it's not quite a, a, a linear probe. It's, it's a wide sector probe, which is giving you a white image. And the wide image basically with sound waves going through is reflecting off a sharp plural line. Now, when it reflects off a sharp plural line, it gives a bright plural image, but some of the sound waves will go in. And when they go in, they will interact with the tissue within the lungs and reflect back. 
And areas of high reflectivity between these areas of the tissue within the lung uh, basically cause sound waves to reflect within these areas, causing much weaker signals. But eventually what you get is ribs, which create this kind of artifact at the back, which is a caustic shadow, which basically is black. And the intercostal space in between, which has a bright pleural line with parallel reflected A lines, which often uh, become less bright because of attenuation. We call this classically the batwing sign. And for all of you, I would say the demonstration of a normal batwing sign is basically a very important aspect of learning how to do lung ultrasound. Because what it means is that you've been able to orient the probe within the rib spaces, uh, in the intercostal kind of space so that you're getting a complete image. And really the reason it's called a bat wing sign is because you've got these margins of the rib which produce rib shadows. So these are the wings of the bat. And then this area of A lines with a plural margin over here, which is basically the, the, the midline of the bat. So really what I'd say from our perspective is what we're trying to do is generate uh, an image which covers at least three of these intercostal spaces with the batwing sign. And normal lung would be a reflective plural margin with parallel A lines. When you have B lines and interstitial fluid in the lungs, then classically what you'll find is this gets obliterated completely and you see no A lines. You will still see the rib shadows posteriorly with the acoustic shadows. So how does this manifest and how does this happen? So classically what you can see is sound waves coming through over here and the rib shadows, obviously, from our perspective, coming in the way, reflecting sound waves back. So the rib shadows reflecting sound waves back mean these areas of the lung can't be seen. And that creates your acoustic shadow. But this area of the lung, which has tissue in it, will be seen. And clearly, these acoustic shadows will create dark areas, whereas this tissue shadow will create the ability to see lung. You will see the plural margin with these ribs seen as this. And this is classically what we call the, the bat wing appearance of normal lung. Just going through it again. There's a lot of interaction over here between the different areas of sound waves and the lung. And this is how it classically looks like. So you can see ribs, acoustic shadow, clear thin plural line, A lines. Now, what are A-lines? A-lines, I would say, are very classically horizontal reverberation artifacts. And they occur because of the interaction of sound waves with the pleural margin and the lung tissue below the pleural margin. So we have an alveoli and we have lung tissue below the pleural margin. Now, clearly what is happening is with the pleura and the alveoli, the alveoli obviously have tissue, uh, tissue is a high reflective surface. Now you have sound waves which basically come, they, they hit the, the pleura and they reflect back. And that's the pleura there that you can see. This is a sector probe. And then after that, what happens is you have lung tissue and they hit the lung tissue and they reflect back. And then they reflect back between the pleura and lung tissue and you have deeper lung tissue. So basically you have this kind of uh, reflection of sound waves in between these areas. And this causes what we call as horizontal reverberations, which classically produce A-lines, depending on attenuation. And you can see that actually there's not too much attenuation in this particular uh, lung field. And I suspect the reason for that is, I mean, this is nine, so the frequency is on the lower side. So because there's less attenuation, you can actually see the deeper areas of the lung really, really nicely. But from my perspective, uh, what you're classically seeing here is pleura with classical A-line appearance. Uh, this is normal. And these are because of horizontal reverberation. So what is happening is that the lung ultrasound is going through, sound waves percolating through. Uh, they hit the pleural margin and then they hit lung tissue. And then you basically have them reverberating back to the, the transducer, but you have them reverberating back against these two surfaces, which is the lung tissue, the pleural margin and the lung tissue, the lung tissue itself, to kind of cause a shaking kind of, of these areas, and these are horizontal reverberation artifacts. So classically what they do from our perspective is they then produce A-lines. And here what you can see is classical attenuation of the A-lines as you move further down because there's attenuation of sound waves as you move in. But what is happening between these interfaces is basically these sound waves bouncing off each other to produce these horizontal uh, artifacts. 
on the other hand, how are B lines generated? Now, this is rib, that's skin. This is classically muscle. There's pleura over here and you have tissue. And between tissue, you have interstitial space. Now, interstitial space we know can have fluid. And in the majority of babies who say have transitioned, fluid transitions to a point where you'll have a minimal amount so that the appearance of no B lines or the appearance of say less than one B line or one B line per intercostal space is considered normal. And the reason these B lines are generated is because of fluid in the interstitial space represented by the blue color that you see over here. How does that happen? So ultrasound waves again, generated, moving into the lung, hitting the pleural margin, reflecting back, creating what you call as your pleural line and your A lines. But when fluid comes in, fluid accumulates in the interstitial spaces and basically comes around the tissue. Now, if it comes around the tissue, there's no ability for the A lines to form because you don't get the horizontal kind of uh, sound wave reverberation artifacts that you would normally get because there's fluid in the interstitial space around the tissue. Now, how is that fluid organized? It's organized as small bubbles, which I'll show you in the form of a tetrahedron. So sound waves tend to reflect back into these areas and they reflect in between these small air bubbles uh, stuck there as opposed to kind of in, in the horizontal areas. And they produce what we call our classical vertical reverberation artifacts that we call B lines. This is what the small, so if I were to magnify these areas which are full of fluid in the interstitial space, you'd be able to see these tetrahedrons. And what you can see is the sound waves basically stuck there uh, they can't reflect back horizontally, they reflect back, they refract, they go all over the place and they create what we call are these vertical artifacts, which we call B lines. Now, the more the accumulation of fluid, the bigger the B lines, to the point where if fluid accumulates in these two areas and totally obliterates tissue uh, and the alveoli also become fluid filled, these B lines merge together and they form what you call compact B lines. If it gets even worse and the alveolar tissue is completely full of fluid, then what you get is an AIS-like picture. And then if I scan, so like I said, what we want to scan is three ribs, two intercostal spaces. But if I scan this space, the next space and the space above that, and all I can see is a complete AIS kind of pattern in every portion, then that's called a white lung appearance. So this is the pathophysiology of generation of vertical beeline artifacts that we see on lung ultrasound. And this is classically how we see them. So these vertical artifacts are seen as beelines. Now, what I'd say is different probes give you different intensity of beelines. And if you use a sector probe uh, that is used, say, for ultrasound with a low frequency, what you can see is what are classically called as these glass-like beelines, which are called that they're basically called glass rockets. They're used in adult terminology, but what they are is basically classically B lines. On the other hand, if you use a linear probe, often what you'll find is that you get a slightly attenuated kind of a clinical feature. Now, this is uh, these these this is plural line. This is tissue, and what you can clearly see is these B lines, which have kind of merged together. So these B lines are coalesced B lines. If the B lines kind of merge together to form one complete portion, then these B lines are becoming more compact, and we call them compact B lines. But clearly, what you can see here is classical progression where the interstitial fluid is going up to the point where these B lines are starting to merge. And I mean, this is basically interstitial edema for you, but it is the interaction between air and fluid in this interstitial space that gives you the patterns that we see, which basically move from profiles from an A profile to an AB profile to a B profile to consolidation and all of these patterns basically interact uh, in a way to give us the pathology that we then interpret. I'll talk a little bit about consolidation when I cover consolidation and effusion when I, when I cover effusion. What I'd say is that using a different frequency can alter how you see and how you define pathology. So this is classically uh, a low frequency sector probe where you can see glass rockets with a very irregular pleural line. On the other hand, this is a linear probe uh, where you can see B lines, which look much thinner. And really what this is, is this is quite a new machine, which basically is using high frequency 12 
but as I mentioned to you, newer machines tend to try and filter out artifacts. So actually what you classically see from your perspective is, uh, uh, you know, no A lines with a, a classical B profile with these B lines, one intercostal space with three B lines, so a B profile. But if you use a sector probe, what you're going to end up with is a picture like this. And they look quite diametrically different, though the interpretation, if you clinically correlate, might be quite similar. So just be aware of these differences. I'm going to finish by saying that we will revise this again. This is not an easy concept, but I will be sending you around some videos. They are there in the section on physics. And I would strongly recommend that you watch them and you spend this week thinking very carefully about these, these concepts, because clearly going forwards, some of these concepts will be very important for you having to optimize your images. In particular, the concepts of frequency, in particular, the, the importance of being able to focus at the plural line, optimizing your depth so that you can actually make the correct interpretation, see deeper consolidations, uh, and uh, you know, in particular, how you define the different types of B lines and classify the different types of B profile. So I'm gonna stop there. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you please repeat the previous slide? This one? Yes, yes. So what 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 I would yes. say is that when, when you look at the interaction in lung tissue of sound waves, what you've got in lung tissue is air coming in through into the alveoli and you've got fluid. And fluid basically could be within the alveoli as you see when the baby is not born. Now there's a there's a video on the first breath and transition. And classically, if you look at that first image, an alveolarized lung, which is full of fluid, has no pleural margin. You can't see an image like that over here. But when the baby takes its first breath and fluid has completely transitioned, you will see a complete absence of interstitial fluid. And that will manifest classically with a pleural margin with parallel A-lines. This is 100% air, this is no fluid. Okay, now if you have a pneumothorax, you'll get a similar appearance, but what you will get is no sliding. And then if you put M mode on, you'll get a barcode sign. Experience says that in babies, most babies will, especially at birth, even if they've aerated their lung, have an element of some element of interstitial fluid. And that interstitial fluid, classically from our perspective, will maybe occasionally give you these comet tail appearances that we saw. You can see them there at the top. You may get anywhere between one to up to three B lines, you know, for a few days. And one B line may persist even in children. So again, what is happening is that air aerating the lung is giving you an A profile. And because the fluid is being completely resolved, you've got a moving pleural margin. But when you do M mode, you get this classical seashore sign. If you come to interstitial syndrome, which is delayed clearance of lung fluids, so transient tachypnea of newborn, or surfactant inactivation with fluid in the interstitial space as is manifested in respiratory distress syndrome, or congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema, then really what is happening is that the interaction between fluid and air is actually reversing. So actually what you're having at this particular point is predominant fluid. And because fluid is coming in, you are generating these interstitial areas with uh, the tetrahedron of fluid bubbles, which reflects the sound waves back, but completely obliterates this, uh, this air, because air will not allow reflection, but fluid will. And that's when you start seeing B lines. Eventually, what you'll find is that there are, uh, you know, other conditions like consolidation, where again, there's an interaction of air and fluid, but again, there's aeration and fluid in it. And there's an interaction between air and fluid with variable percentages. But at the end of the day, what is very important is that if you have no air, completely no air, uh, with an absent plural line, and you've got a uh, lung that's, say, white and tissue-like, then that basically, for me, could reflect atelectasis. But again, a plural effusion basically with fluid in the margin will present as a hypoechoic kind of an area. So what, what this slide is basically demonstrating is that the different pathologies 
of what we see as well as normal on a lung ultrasound is basically an interaction between air and fluid in different areas, which is basically uh, also interacting with lung tissue to reflect sound waves in a way so that it gives you a typical pattern. And that typical pattern is what we are aiming to recognize as part of our training in the first four weeks. I'm more interested in your ability to be able to give me a structured approach to lung ultrasound. And for me, the important aspect when, when you're describing your lung ultrasound, again, is there's a learning curve. But if you can show me the batwing appearance, pleural sliding, and interpret what you think of the lung in terms of visible A and B lines. That's all I want to see in the next two weeks. I am quite happy for you to learn profiles as time passes by. Uh, but I think if we can just describe from our perspective what the normal batwing sign looks like in a normal lung, what uh, A lines and B lines look like, and your interpretation of what kind of B lines you see in the context of the probes that you're using. I think we're looking at pattern recognition at this particular stage. Once we're able to do that, then we're really looking at going back to pattern recognition and normalcy versus pathology, depending on what we and clinical course and history the baby's actually showing us. And really, this is this is the importance of being able to know, uh, I would say, the the physics of lung ultrasound is that I hope you're being able to understand why the different pathologies are giving you those patterns. That is the important take home message from my perspective. Any other questions? This is not an easy concept. I, 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 it's, it's a concept that's pretty difficult, but it's an important one. And I'd say that if you want to teach lung ultrasound, but in particular, if you want to understand uh, the current nature of A and B lines, uh, which, you know, if you read different literature, people have given different kind of uh, concepts of how A and B lines are generated. But a lot of people even say that the ring down artifact is not actually how B lines are generated. But at least I would say our authors, uh, and in particular, you know, Dr. Liu, they, they give us these concepts of how A and B lines are generated. And I think for me, what is important from your perspective is a, a recognition of why these lines are formed based on the fluid content and how it interacts within the lungs, because there is a difference between RDS and transient tachypnea of newborn, and there's a difference between just interstitial edema as well. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about pathology. So I'm gonna invite questions very quickly. So any questions? No questions? Have I shocked everybody into silence? I, I think, uh, look, there are, there, there are lots of things to digest here. Mm. It's quite a, quite a, um, a, a very, very um, heavy lecture, I would say, especially mm. for my level of understanding. Uh, but it is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for making it um, much easier and uh, to understand. Uh, I think uh, maybe on Thursday, I guess there, there will be a session on Thursday. Maybe the, the once the information has settled in my brain, perhaps I will come up with some questions. I will go back and uh, uh, listen to your lecture again, and then uh, be prepared for lots and lots of points. But thank you so much. That's brilliant. Sir, I completely empathize with the, you know. Uh, some of you in terms of the, the heaviness of the lecture and the challenge from our perspective is, uh, and I would say this is the lecture, but there is a very nice visual representation through the videos on the portal in the chapter on physics. And I would strongly recommend that you watch the videos because the lecture alone basically is giving you a flavor and an introduction to the concept more detail is available in the text section for those who want to have wider reading. What we will be doing on Thursday is we will be going through a quick recap of all of these things. But more importantly, I think on Thursday, I will be showing you some videos of what the normal lung ultrasound looks like with superimposed videos of, of A and B lines and how they're generated. 
And I'm hoping that we'll be able to translate some of this into visual learning. Uh, so, you know, my, 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 my commiserations, but please, I would say, use the four days in between to please read and watch the videos because it'll really help me for the next session. And I would also say, guys, it's a really good opportunity the first four weeks because the next Thursday we'll be having uh, more peer review. Uh, please uh, start, put a probe on the chest if you haven't already done so. And you know what is, what is being presented right now is very high quality in terms of what our colleagues are doing. Uh, uh, anything else? Hello, can I ask what time are we meeting on the 26th? Um, because it's not on the schedule. Um, it's seven. It'll be seven. It's seven. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit tricky for some of the UK participants because it's a little bit early. I think the slight problem that we face is if, if we do later, we put the participants in India to sleep. Uh, so it's, but what I'd say is again, don't feel too stressed about missing. There's a lot of repetition in the next three sessions. This was very heavy. Uh, next time will be easier. You'll have read some of the literature as well. And uh, clearly from our perspective, once, once you get the concept of being able to understand interstitial fluid and how you progress with B lines as part of B profile, I think that for me would be a very important, uh, you know, uh, kind of a stepping stone to actually improving your lung ultrasound imaging. Because B lines can really change based on how you do your lung ultrasound, what probes you use. And I think that's really important. Thank you so much. Would you be able to spend maybe just five minutes and talk about how to save this image in JPEG? Because the machine that I'm using, it just only gives it in DICOM and then I'm unable to play it onto the Mac to share. Is that okay? Can, I've done a small video of how I've done it on the GE, which okay. I will share with you on Tuesday with all of you. So two things that you will get between Monday and Thursday this week. So you're going to get a step-by-step -step guide of how to put, uh, how to do a lung ultrasound, uh, which basically re-emphasizes the protocol. And then just a step-by-step -step guide of how you image optimize. Now, obviously from my perspective, not every machine is the same, but the principles are the same. So those are two things that I want to do between Monday and Thursday, but I am going to emphasize Thursday is more of today. And I know you guys are not going to like it. I know you guys have hated today's lecture, but I can't emphasize how important it is. You really need to be able to understand this. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a good evening, guys. God bless you all. And thank you for your stamina. I am really, really grateful. Thank you, Alok. Thank you. Thank so you. Bye.